Hello, Saints. I'm Ernette, and this is Zebulun, where truth lives, sharing the everlasting gospel found in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6, also known as the three angels' message. Today's topic, Ephesus and Smyrna, the great controversy from persecution to darkness, part one. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to break the bread of life. We pray that your Holy Spirit would come and instruct us in righteousness, Lord. Illuminate our minds. Give us that eye salve that we might see and hearts willing to obey, Father God. Hide your word in our heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so today... Um, as we continue through the great controversy, uh, chapter one, we talked about the destruction of Jerusalem, and now chapter two is persecution in darkness. Uh, uh, I mean, from persecution to darkness. Uh, actually, uh, chapter one, let's go back and let's take a look at, uh, this is the table of contents for the great controversy. You see chapter one was the destruction of Jerusalem. Chapter two is persecution in the first centuries. Okay, so that's where our focus is going to be on the first centuries of the Christian era. From the time of Christ to about 300 AD, that's the time period we're going to cover today. And um, if you missed a presentation, it should have been the last one because this one is powerful. So buckle your seatbelt. But first, I'd like to introduce, take this opportunity to introduce you to my partners. Of, for, of course, the Holy Spirit, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he's the producer of this. Um, I'm just his assistant. But my partners are you who are watching these videos. Uh, those who are receptive to truth. As you receive truth, be sure to like it and share it with others. Merely liking a video strengthens the algorithm and it makes it available to more people. Sharing the vid video is as easy as clicking the text message. We're actually sharing the video is as easy as clicking the share and then click the text message for, or you can click Facebook and typing a name from your contacts and then click send and then you can just send it to somebody. That's what I do a lot. Um, I used to listen to uh, a lot of, I still listen to a lot of videos, uh, Walter Byth, James Rafferty, Ivor Meyer, Stephen Bohr, Isaac Olotunji, Ron Kelly, Conrad Vine, just to name a few. And uh, I share these uh, videos with others that uh, might be blessed with them in a form of my ministry. Um, so feel free to, to just share these videos um, and partner with me in spreading the gospel to the world. That's one of the things Christ is waiting for, this gospel to spread to the whole world, then he's going to come again. The Great Controversy as a commentary on the Bible. Okay, this book we're reading, The Great Controversy, um, you can look at it as a, as a commentary. And it's a commentary, the great controversy, the book, it starts in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, 40 years after the crucifixion. And it takes you all the way to the end of the world. So it's, a, it's from the cross to the end of the world. That's the period it covers. Uh, that's the same time period that's covered in the book of Revelation. Um, it's centuries plural. So we're talking about... Uh, uh, from the time of Christ to about 300 AD. And like I said, this is the same time period covered in the book of Revelation by the first and second uh, churches. In the book of Revelation, you have the seven churches they cover from the time of Christ to the end time. But the first church covers from Ephesus, covers from 30 AD to 100 AD. And then the second church, Smyrna, covers from 100 AD to 313 AD in terms of church history. The first and second seals and the first and second trumpets run concurrently 
In other words, they cover the same time span. And I'll show you that shortly using the sanctuary template. Since the great controversy and the seven churches and the seven seals and the seven trumpets all cover the same time span, namely 300 AD to the second coming of Christ, then we can think of the great controversy as a commentary on the book of Revelation. And later you'll see it also as a commentary on the book of Daniel chapter 11 and 12, for that matter. We'll talk about that later. We're going to let this lesser light, the great controversy, illuminate the greater light of the Bible. Here's a synchronization of the seven historic epics of Revelation. When you look at the book of Revelation, the first thing you come across is the seven churches. After a brief introduction in chapter two um, of Revelation, you come across the seven churches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they cover, like I said, from 30 AD all the way to the second coming of Christ. The first church is Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And then running concurrently with them, you have the, in Revelation 6, you see the seven seals. And the first seal is a white horse. The second seal is the red horse. The third seal is a black horse. The fourth seal is a pale horse. Then you have the fifth is the souls of, under the altar. The sixth is earthquake. And the seventh is silence in heaven in the space of a half an hour. And then running concurrently with that, oh, excuse me. We have the seven trumpets. The first trumpet, second trumpet, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet. Now, the um, the churches, the seven churches, it pretty much goes over church history. It's the church cycle or church, church epic. Each one of these is an epic of time. And, and the seven churches covers church history. The seven seals covers the same period of time, but it's more of a political cycle. It looks at some of the interactions between governments and the people. And then the seven trumpets of Revelation 8 uh, cover more of the military, how God fights for his church. This is how God provides for his church, how his church interacts with the world, and how God fights for his church. And you're going to see those things as we go forward. Today, I'm going to, let's come out of here. Um, we're just going to cover this first, this first, uh, let me change this to white. Okay. We're just going to cover this for the sake of time. Today, we're only going to cover Ephesus and Smyrna. No, I guess I could put that back. Today, we're going to cover Ephesus and and Smyrna. And then next time we'll, we'll cover uh, the first and second seal and the first and second trumpet. But I don't want to try to bite off too much at once. And we're already going to cover a lot today. And we'll come back to this chart again. Sanctuary symbolism and historicism. You need to understand about historicism. I'm a historicist. When I approach the book of Revelation, I use the historicist approach. There are two other approaches, the preterist and the futurist views. I'm going to briefly touch on them right now. Around 1500, exactly 1545 to 1563, the Catholic Church had what they called the Council of Trent. And when they came together to develop the Counter-Reformation, why was that necessary? Because during the Reformation, all of the Protestant reformers were identifying the Roman Catholic Church as the beast of Revelation, as the little horn of Daniel, and as the Antichrist, um, and, the, and the, sec, the man of sin from 2 Thessalonians. And so they had a meeting to counter that. How can we get this attention off of us being identified as the beast? And a couple of things they did. One of the things they did is they came up with the Jesuits uh, under Ignatius Loyola. He actually started a few years before this council. And the whole purpose of the Jesuits is to overturn the Reformation. 
and they work behind the scenes in various governments and institutions to overthrow the Protestant Reformation. And they take an oath of loyalty um, to the papacy. To, and uh, so the Jesuits was founded. And they came up with two alternative biblical views because all the Protestant reformers were historicists. Historicist just means that you start in Revelation, the first church is the time of Christ, and it's an epic of time. And then the second church uh, is, is, is the next in, in chronological order. Then the third church and the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. It just follows the flow of history in a logical left to right manner. That's historicism. What they came up with they first came up with preterism. Preterism, you take the 70th week. No, no, you take all the, the prophecies and you put them in the past. And you say that they were all fulfilled. And so they really have no meaning today. And um, you can study that more on your own, but it's a false teaching. Futurism, uh, they take some of the elements of, of historicism, but then in uh, Daniel's uh, 70th week, they take it and project it into the future after the rapture, which once again is unbiblical. And so, um, but the Protestant reformers rejected these views, but modern day Protestants have bought it hook, line, and sinker. Um, most evangelicals have bought into this uh, rapture and the 70th week being detached and placed into the future. And it's very unfortunate um, you can look at the sanctuary, you can look at the stories in the Bible to see that um, the rapture, uh, a, a rapture, a pre-advent rapture is unbiblical. Uh, for example, let's take the history of Elijah. Elijah represents the church. And you had Jezebel. She represented Babylon. You had Ahab. He represented the kings of the earth. And in Elijah, he had a time of trouble, right? What was his time of trouble? That's right. It was when the uh, drought came and for three and a half years. Now, was Elijah raptured out before the drought or did he go through the drought? He went through the drought and he represents the church. We're going to go through the time of trouble. And then at the end, he was raptured to heaven. Um, just like the church will be raptured after the time of trouble. And uh, that's an example of how you can use some of the stories in the Bible to help you understand, because um, they're types and anti-types, and they can help us understand the flow of some of these things. Uh, the New Testament, I told you before that, remember we studied the sanctuary, and if any of you are watching this video and haven't watched, this is my 10th video. If you haven't seen the other, videos, especially the ones on the sanctuary, I would encourage you to go and watch them first, unless you already have an understanding of the sanctuary. Um, we're going to look at the sanctuary type right now. Did you know that the, uh, I, I told you that that's the way God operates. Um, and so we're going to look at right now, did you know the whole New Testament is laid out in a pattern of the sanctuary? Let's take a look. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all tell us how God forgives by the shedding of blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And all the four Gospels talk about the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and they're all about the cross. So the Gospels are all about the altar. So that would be right here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then we come to after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what's the next book? Acts. And Acts is the labor. That's the water, the cleansing, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts. That uh, is represented there. And that water, that cleansing water continues all the way through Romans to Jude, how God cleanses and purifies his church. That's what the letters of Paul are all about. That's what uh, um, the books of the New Testament are about, teaching how God cleanses his and purifies his church. 
And after Jude, that brings us to the book of Revelation. Now let's take a look at the sanctuary pattern. If, if we're following the sanctuary, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the altar, and the book of Acts all the way to Jude is the purification of the water, then what would we expect to see next? That's right. We would expect to see something in the holy place. And when we get to the book of Revelation, that's exactly what we see. Because the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, let's go there. Revelation 1, 12 and 13. And here's John speaking. I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and so you see a few things here. You see uh, Jesus is in the midst of the candlesticks. So he's in the holy place, okay? He's following the sanctuary pattern. And not only that, but he's dressed in the priestly garments as a high priest. He's clothed with a garment down to the foot, and he's girt about the loins, about the paps with a golden girdle like the high priest wore. And so we see Christ in the sanctuary among the candlesticks, um, following the pattern of the sanctuary. And then after the seven after the seven candlesticks, you get to uh, the seven seals. And um, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter five and verse one. Now, the seven seals come out from the table of showbread. Revelation five and verse one. Let's go back here. Okay. Revelation 5, 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within him on the backside, sealed with seven seals. So he has a book, and it's sealed with seven seals. What in the sanctuary represented a book? Anybody remember? That's right. The table of showbread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Those uh, two stacks of six loaves of bread represented uh, the word of God. And so that's the table of showbread. And they're sealed. This book is sealed with seven seals. So the table of showbread, it comes from out of the um, table of showbread. And also, um, and then the third one is the trumpets. The trumpets come from out of the altar of prayer, okay? We're going to look at Revelation chapter 8 to see that. The seven trumpets come from the altar of prayer. So this Revelation 8, verse 2 to 4. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. Now he's standing at the altar in the courtyard, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it. And he took it into the altar in the holy place, the altar of prayer, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So you see the seven seals come out of the altar of 
incense or prayer. So once again, that brings us back to the sanctuary. So you have the altar of prayer right here. So in review, we had the uh, we had the uh, seven churches or the lamps, the seven seals or table of showbread, and then the seven uh, trumpets come out of the altar of incense. And then what would be next? The most holy place. So let's go and see if that's what's next. Oops. Now, before we move on, um, the um, holy place, it shows how God sustains his church throughout history. And they run concurrently. The, the candlesticks, the showbread, and the altar of prayer was a daily sacrifice. And they were they ran concurrently. And that's why our uh, our seven churches, seven seals, and seven trumpets run concurrently. They overlap each other. They repeat and enlarge. They repeat the same time period and give more information. So each time you get a more and more in-depth understanding of that epic of time. And so um, the most holy place shows how God eradicates sin and unrepentant sinners. So then review the uh, Gospels, they show how God forgives sin by the shedding of blood. The labor shows how God cleanses and purifies us through the water of his Holy Spirit. And the candlesticks, the showbread, and the altar of prayer show how God sustains his church through history, through this history, from 30 AD all the way to the second coming. In all these three areas, the church cycle, political cycle, military cycle, how God sustains his church. And in the most holy place, we see how God eradicates sin and unrepentant sinners, how he gets rid of sin from the universe. When we when we confess our sins now, they go to the most holy place, but they're they're placed in the uh on the altar and in the holy place until the day of atonement. And then they're finally blotted out. So in the Day of Atonement, the sins are blotted out. And um, you can see that in Revelation 11 and verse 19, um, where he sees for the first time into the holy place, the most holy place. And um, that is at the end of the 2300-year prophecy. And uh, we'll talk about that at a future time. Uh, the whole book of Revelation is what we call a chiasm. It's like this. And you have the um, the first, the seven churches, seven seals, and seven trumpets leading up to Revelation 11. And then after 11, you have the ending, the end times, you know, the seven last plagues, the judgments, and the earth made new, the new Jerusalem. So that's the structure of the book of Revelation. So these these seven epics of time take us halfway through the book. This takes us all the way to Revelation 11. And, um, and then we begin to uh, go down from there. Um, the sanctuary template helps us avoid false doctrine. Well, let's take a look at something here. So here you have, I was just talking about the 2300 years. Remember that the, the the 490-year prophecy started at the same time as the 2300-year prophecy with the commandment, the, de the decree to rebuild Jerusalem given by Artaxerxes in 457 BC. And after the 490 years, there were still 1810 years left. And if you follow, we know these, we know this day-year principle is accurate because Christ was crucified and baptized exactly at the right time. And if so, if you follow it all the way 18, 10 years into the future, it brings you to the year Jesus, Stephen was stoned in AD 34. If you add 1810 years to that, it brings you to the year of 1844. And that's when the sanctuary was cleansed. The great day of atonement, the investigative judgment began. And so that brings us here. Um, so you can, so 
You therefore cannot apply the holy place symbols after 1844 because the holy place events don't happen after the Day of Atonement. They happen before. In other words, we can put timelines on these things. Um, right here, the baptism of Christ and his ascension into heaven. We know this is right around 30 AD right here. And then the uh, 2300 year prophecy, it ends right here when the Day of Atonement and the uh, cleansing of the sanctuary. This is 1844. If you add those 1810 days to the 490, it brings you to 1844. So we can tell what we are right here. So these things happened before 1844. So you cannot apply the seven trumpets after 1844 because it won't fit with the sanctuary. You cannot say uh, the seven trumpets one of them is Russia today. No, because that's after 1844. So this, the sanctuary boxes us in and lets us know the time periods that we're talking about. As a matter of fact, um, here you have the ascension of Christ in 30 AD and all the way to the end times. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You could kind of look at the sanctuary like this. Here's 30, 34 AD. So you have the first church, the first trumpet, first, you know, the first epic right here, then the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and then the seventh. And then you have the cleansing of the sanctuary, 1844. So you can kind of look at it like that as well. You can also um, look at the feast days and uh, verify that what we're saying, what I'm saying is biblical because you had the seven feast days the, the Jews had seven feast days that they um, every year they covered the whole salvation history from beginning to end. And then, and then the next year they repeated it over and over. And the first at the altar was uh, represented Passover, the feast of unleavened breads and the feast of first fruits. That was all at the altar. Then the day, the next feast was the day of Pentecost. That was at the laver. And Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church because that's the laver. It represents the Holy Spirit. And then after that, you had the feast of um, trumpets, which was a warning about the coming day of atonement. The day of the, the feast of trumpets happened on the first day of the seventh month and they blew the trumpets and it was a warning to Israel that the day of atonement was at hand. It was coming. The day of atonement is represented in the most holy place. So these three things all represent uh, the blowing of the trumpets um, from, from beginning all the way to Revelation eleven nineteen, basically. And in a Revelation 19, 11, 19, you go into the most holy place for the Day of Atonement. So you can uh, look at the feast days also and follow that pattern. Um, it validates our interpretation. The Old Testament is the foundation and the book of Revelation is the rooftop. You could think of the Old Testament, the feast days, uh, all the stories in the Old Testament. That's the foundation. And then the revelation is the rooftop. Now, you have to put the roof on top of the foundation. You cannot put it to the left. You cannot put it to the right. It needs to go above the foundation so your structure is sound. And that's the purpose of the sanctuary and the Old Testament. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about repeat and enlarge in the seven, seven epics of church history. Today, we're only going to cover Ephesus and Smyrna. Next time, we'll cover uh, the white horse, the red horse, and the first and second trumpets. Um, but today, we're only going to cover these first two books, uh, Ephesus and Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2. So we're going to turn there right now. This covers the church cycle, the church history. So let's go there. Um, 
Revelation chapter 2. And I'm just going to read it in your hearing. The church of, in Ephesus. Unto the angel of the heavenly father, as we read your word, we just pray that you would bless it in Jesus name. Amen. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven candlesticks. And he says, I know thy works. Let's stop right there. You see, Jesus, these seven churches, they were not all perfect. Two of them, each church, he gave them a commendation and a criticism, a commendation and a rebuke. But two of the churches only got a commendation. They didn't get rebuked. So that's good for them. But whether they got a commendation or a rebuke, Jesus was still in the midst of them. The churches that had to be rebuked, he didn't say, well, I'm when you get your act together, I'll put my candlestick in the midst of you. No, he's in the midst of you uh, even as he's working with you. Uh, and he knows our works. Jesus knows all about us, and he still loves us. That's amazing right there. And he, he said, I know thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which are say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Um, now, what do you have to be to be an apostle? What's an apostle? An apostle is someone who saw Jesus Christ and who was taught directly by Jesus Christ. They lived at the same time as Jesus and were taught by Jesus. The 12 apostles, they're apostles because they were taught by Christ. Even Paul is an apostle because Jesus came on the road to Damascus and taught him. And so this lets you know that the seven, um, that this first church of Ephesus is in from 300 to 100 AD. This verifies the time period. Why? Because in order to be an apostle, the oldest apostle was the apostle John. He wrote the book of Revelation in AD 90, and he was like 90 years old. So the apostles lived in the first century. No apostle lived to be 300 years old. They all lived and died in the first century AD. So this lets you know that we're accurate in putting the book of Ephesus in that time period. Whoops, where was I? I was here. And are not, and has found them liars. There are many false, uh, okay. And has born and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. So they're, per they're persevering. They're not getting tired. They're not giving up. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. What does God have against them? Thou hast left thy first love. So the early church, they were on fire and they received many commendations, but as time went on, their fire was dimming and Jesus had to rebuke them that they lost their first love. The book of Revelation is a love story, God pursuing his church. God giving his church another chance. God coming in the midst of his church, even though they make mistakes, and him working with them. And they only become desolate when they just finally reject him like Jerusalem did, and he has to leave them desolate. Because see, God's forgiveness doesn't just go forever and ever. There is a limit. Um, remember in the book of Matthew, I believe, when Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Did Jesus say, just keep forgiving him forever? No, he didn't. He said 70 times seven. Many people interpret that to mean forever. It doesn't mean forever. It's a finite number. 70 times seven is 490. That number should ring a bell with those of you who have been studying with me. And so there's a limit to God's patience. He'll keep on knocking at the door. He'll keep pursuing you. But uh, eventually, if you persist in sin, he's going to leave you and honor your choice. And 
So the destruction of Jerusalem, they really brought it upon themselves. God wasn't destroying them. He just left them to their own devices, left them to uh, Satan, and Satan did his work on them. And so um, even when we look back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they had a first love with God. They uh, communed with him face to face. And when they sinned, they lost that first love. And, um, you know, it's played out throughout the, um, the centuries. Um, and God is calling us back to that first love. Um, let's continue on. Remember, once thou art fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place. So he's warning them to repent and return to their first love. But this thou hast, in other words, this is something else good, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. Nicholas was a deacon. Um, let's turn quickly to Acts chapter 5. Acts 5. Let's see if I can find it. Verse. No, it's not there. Anyway, I don't see what I'm looking for, but what I was going to show you is um, when they picked the seven deacons, one of them was Nicholas, but Nicholas eventually... Um, Nicholas eventually um, apostatized and began teaching false teachings. And um, and that's what's referred to by the teachings of the Nicolaitans. He was a false teacher. And um, God was rebuking him. Let's go back to Revelation 2. Um, you can see down here the Nicolaitans is mentioned in the church of Pergamum, along with Balaam. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Remember, Balaam was a false prophet. He was a prophet, supposed to be a prophet of God, but he was a prophet against the nation of Israel, or he tried to, uh, to for money. And um, so Balaam and Nicola, Nicol, Nicholas were um, false teachers. And this is uh, commending Ephesus for rejecting these false teachers. Ephesus, if you notice, they got a very good report. I, I wouldn't mind having that report for myself. Um, look what it says. I know thy works, I know thy labor, thy patience, and thou canst not bear them which are evil, and has tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, and has borne and had patience for my name's sake, and labored and has not fainted. That's a very good report that I wouldn't mind having myself. And then, um, let me just go over here and make sure I didn't miss anything I wanted to talk about. They lost their first love. Um, and you notice at the end, it tells them um, Adam and Eve lost their first love. And look what it says to the Ephesus. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So he wants to return us all the way back to the tree of life. And uh, that was in the Garden of Eden. That's the whole plan of salvation, the purpose of the plan of salvation. And so now let's go to the uh, next churches, Smyrna. Smyrna means bittersweet, and they had a bittersweet experience. Um, 
Revelation 2, verse 8 to 11. It's right here. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. You know what? We're going to stop here, and I'm going to do Smyrna next time, because I don't want to go too long with this lesson. So let's go back here. And so next time, uh, when we come together, we're going to take a look at Smyrna. And so you can see where we are in the scheme of time right here. Um, so we've covered Ephesus, um, and now we're going to take a look at Smyrna. And then we'll cover the white horse and the red horse and the first and second trumpets on next time. So next time, first and second seals, white and red horse. Actually, let me add this. Next time, uh, Smyrna, the second church. And then after that, we'll do the first and second seals and first and second trumpets. Okay. And my prayer is that may we be faithful unto death and receive a crown of life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson today as we studied uh, about Ephesus, Lord, and about um, your church in the first century, um, in the great controversy, the persecution and the faithfulness of that first church, Lord. And we pray that um, we can take heed to these messages, Lord, and they, they can be um, life-changing for us. Continue to be with us until next time. In Jesus' name, amen.